freedom, liberation, emancipation, Juneteenth, a time to remember what was and to dream about what could be, a time to learn about our history and plan for a better future together. A time to recognize and honor our differences and refuse to ignore them. A time to rejoice in the beauty of diversity and to celebrate our common humanity. A time to pray for equity, fairness, progress, and justice. A time to consider how far we've come and take another step forward together. church family. Welcome to week three of Summer at City Hope. We are so thankful that you joined Something us this I love weekend. Our church. Now, I most of you guys right know here. I am still and on summer break video and I'll be back like the first weekend of July, left. just in time for our National yeah. Surf Day. Yeah. And I am so excited about that. You need to make sure you're part of that. Today, yeah. we have the privilege, the honor and privilege of having one of my best friends in the world, Pastor Drew Frider with us. Pastor Drew and I met in October of 2020 on a pastor's trip in Montana. We found out really quick that we had a lot in common. We just had this brotherhood that started immediately. We found out we launched our churches on the same day. And Pastor Drew is no stranger here to City Hope Church. He's coming all the way from Salisbury, Maryland, where he pastors an incredible church called Lift Church. And that God is doing incredible things through their ministry there in, in the, uh, the Eastern Shore. So I'm glad that he's with us today. So would you do me a favor? Would you stand up on your feet, put your hands together, and let's welcome Pastor Drew Fry. What's up? Hey, wh while you're still standing, can we make it really loud for Jesus right now? Come on. We love you, Lord. It's all about you. Hey, thank you so much. You can be seated, and uh, I send some greetings and some love from Salisbury, Maryland. Lift Church loves City Hope. I love being at City Hope. If I'm not going to be home at my home church, it just feels like a second home because it's my fourth time here. And uh, I'm telling you what, what Pastor Ben said, uh, we, we text each other multiple times a week, and we just love being able to do ministry together. And how many of y'all know y'all have a gift in Pastor Ben and the team here at City Hope, all the pastors here. He brags on you guys all the time, and my, my wife loves connecting with Annalise, and um, we just love whenever we get to hang out together. If I'm new to you, then um, we are the exact opposite of the Murrays. They are a, they are a boy fam. And we are a girl fam. Come on. So th this, is, uh, this is a little look at uh, my family. And I have been blessed with three daughters. And um, some have gotten to be here. All of them love your boys. In fact, they, they don't care as much about City Hope as, as much as tell Gibson hello and tell Gideon hello. And come on, they, they, they connect. And um, that's pretty cool. Uh, here's what's going on in my life, in case any of y'all can identify with this. My oldest is 
is now 15 and a half, and so she's got her permit in Maryland. Come on now. Hey, we, we're, we're enjoying life, and it's been a lot of fun, and I'm glad to be here. I'm also honored to be with you guys um, uh, during Juneteenth week. I, um, I, I did my research on that, learning that really that originated here in Texas, and so um, this is pretty cool uh, to, to celebrate freedom, to celebrate uh, um, the end of a disagreement that our, our nation had in its history on, um, uh, we celebrated this week. And I think that that's important for today's message because as the nation was growing, so does the disagreements begin to grow. And this is pretty much a universal principle that I want to address today because you'll find out if you haven't already, as your family grows or as your family blends, come on now, if your family blends and grows, all of a sudden there's wonderful things, but there are an increase in disagreements. Um, How many of y'all know that as the church grows, as your small group grows, there can be a, a more frequent disagreements? And see, we need to learn biblically how we're supposed to handle our emotions and disagreements because 100 out of 100 out of us have had disagreements even this week. And the Bible, thankfully, is something that I get to stand on, we get to stand on, and it teaches me how I'm supposed to act in every single situation. And as I was saying, um, that that we, uh, uh, Pastor Ben really, he, he, he brags on City Hope so often. He loves you guys. I was talking to him yesterday. I want to, if he brags on y'all, I want to rag on him for just a minute because I was talking to him on the phone and he was about to go to the national championship game. Come on. How many of y'all know he loves the University of Tennessee? Come on. I, I told him he's not fasting enough. Come on. Y'all saw the <laughs> la- last night any Texas A&M fans up in here? <laughs> I didn't know if I could mess with with my boy Ben, but uh, yeah, Pastor Ben, he, he's out there, but he, he talks a lot about, hey, awesome things are happening at City Hope, but I, I, I want to give you almost like a prophetic precaution that God gave me uh, in my spirit as I was preparing for today comes from Galatians 5, 7, and 8. And because God's got big works and he hasn't even really gotten started yet. He's got amazing things in store for your family. He's got amazing things in store for City Hope, for Wichita Falls, and, and wherever God wants to take you. But here, we got to remember this. You were running a good race, the Apostle Paul says. Who cut in on you? to keep you from obeying the truth, that kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And so we have an adversary, we have an enemy, and he is not stoked when the kingdom of God grows big and hell gets shorter and and heaven gets bigger. So when he gets seething, when he gets upset, it can happen in your family dynamics. It can happen in your small group dynamics. It can happen with uh, someone sitting on this side versus someone sitting on this side. Come on. The enemy wants to stir up strife, stumbling blocks, and issues so that he can slow down the kingdom work that's being done. Come on, City Hope. I need to hear if there's some people who are going to stand against that kind of resistance and give God some glory this morning. Here's the good news. You and I play a part in whether Satan wins in this or not. It's, 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 it's the heavens giving you heads up. You dictate how much stifling the enemy is able to do. And so it's on us, it's on each individual. Poke your neighbor right now and say, it's about you, it's about me. Tell, poke your other neighbor, it's about me. And how we going family? Come on, I didn't expect to say that, but it rhymed. It rhymed. If it rhymes, it's from the Holy Spirit. Anyway. So today, today I want to share with you something that God put on my heart that is highly practical. So I hope you'll take pictures of the screen or take notes, however you like to journal, but it's going to be highly spiritual as well. It's a, it's a message that I've entitled, Dealing with Disagreements. Dealing with Disagreements. This is so very spiritual, even as we get into the how to handle disagreements, because even Jesus was asked, hey, what are the two greatest commandments? Can you like sum up that whole Old Testament for me? And he said, 
Sure, love God with all your heart. Come on, if you know it, say it with me. With all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he said, and love your neighbor. Loving my neighbor, is that spiritual? It's highly spiritual. It is your witness to a lost world that we have a God of reconciliation. We have a God of unity. We have a God of love. We have a God of peace. And he is living and dwelling in me. So the way you treat your neighbor tes, says a lot about the God you worship. And so the Bible is full of disagreements. Some of them end up healthy. A lot of them end up okay or not so great. And some of the disagreements in the Bible are just straight up explosive. I'm talking there are little children being eaten by bears. Come on. There, there is the earth opening up and eating, uh, um, uh, eating people who stirred up rebellions against Moses and, and, and uh, um, all kinds of issues and divisive and explosive things. So we get to see how to do it right and we see a lot of things that we learn, hey, I don't want to do it like that. I want to learn from it. Today's account, if you've got your Bible, you're going to want to go in Joshua chapter 22. Joshua 22, and I'm uh, about to meet you there, but I love giving context when I share the words so that you understand. The Torah, or the first five books of the Bible, is full of the formulative story that God wanted his people to know about who he is and who they are in his eyes. Uh, the crux of it, the biggest highlight is Moses taking the Israelites, his people, out of slavery and bondage and out of Egypt and into, uh, towards a promised land. And so on their way there, they, they, um, um, Moses dies in the wilderness and Joshua rise up, rises up, and Moses gave Joshua some instructions. When you get there, there's 12 different families. There's 12 different tribes. Each of them is designated a land. So go take it all and then divvy it up for the 12 tribes. And so let me show you real quick. Um, there it is. Come on. Uh, um, a map of Israel, especially back then, when they came up, and this is going to be helpful to understand, that when they came up, there, there is a uh, Sea of Galilee. By the way, I got to um, swim in the Sea of Galilee with Pastor Ben right there. We went to Israel together a year and a half ago. And then there is a Jordan River headed down to the Dead Sea. What you need to understand is that mostly God was saying that the West Said, come on, on the West Side. Said, that's your land. That's your promised land. But God's people came up to their land from the east side. And, and some of them, including Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. How come Manasseh got so much land, bro? Come on. It, it, I'd say, what's up with Manasseh? Anyway, they came up from the east side. And before they crossed the Jordan to go take their land... They started saying, our wives kind of like this land right here. Our kids kind of like the terrain. They feel at home here. Our cattle like the grass here. Here's what I think they were saying. We don't know if the grass is greener on the other side, so can we have dibs on this side? And Joshua made them agreement that, that really wasn't a part of the plan, but hey, more land for everybody else if, if you want to do that. Here's the only condition. Come fight with us. Stand by your brothers. Help us take the west side. And when you do, when we have it all, then you can go back to your wives, children, and your cattle, and you can occupy the east side. What we are about to experience right now in Joshua 22 is going to be one of the first disagreements that these 12 tribes have after occupying the land. And guess what? It's going to be old school um, Romeo and Juliet. We're going to have a west side versus east side showdown. So let's look at what the scripture says in Joshua 22. It says, the rest of Israel, the west side. Someone say west side. West side. Someone say east side. All right, you say west side? You say east side? It sounds like kids camp already. Come on, kids blast. It's already good. It says the, 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 the west side, the rest of Israel heard that the people of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh had built an altar. Let me hear your most exasperated, how could they? 
Come on. Come on, ladies. I know you got a better one than that. Come on. <laughs> Give it to me one more time. How could they? How could they build another altar? Is this really a big deal? Yes. There is one, at this time, there is one central temple. There is one Ark of the Covenant. There is one place that God's dwelling dwells. There is one place for sacrifices. There is one place that the Levitical priests bring it all together. There is one place that you're supposed to pilgrimage to. And now the east side, girl, have you heard the east side? They built their own altar. Oh my goodness. Here's what they're saying. They all are going to hell over there on the east side. They all got problems with God. They built an altar over there. So the whole community of the West Side gathered at Shiloh and prepared to go to war against them. Before they can build a foreign altar, we're going to kill them. We're going to kill them all. We don't care if they're part of our family, our tribe, or not. They sat in the wrong seats in this church. Come on, don't you know? The west side is the most anointed side up in here. They had some problems in their camp. And I need you to understand that right now it's not looking very good. To hear, hey, there's problems over there. Can you hear? Do you know what our next door neighbors did? Do you know what they're doing at the small group next door? Do you know what they're doing at the church down the street? Do you know what? Do you know what? It it looks like it's about to get explosive. They about to go to war. So I want to give you some things that God spoke to me through this scripture to help out today. Uh, four wise ways to deal with disagreements. If you're taking notes today, I highly encourage you to write this down. This is going to be helpful. By the way, try to focus on you, not your neighbor. <laughs> Not the person sitting next to you like, hey, you want to take notes today. I can tell this is going to be a good message. <laughs> It will not be a good ride home for you, okay? <laughs> Number one, four wise ways to deal with disagreements. Get the full story. Get the full story. Let me show it to you in Joshua 22. They said, get all of our men. We're about to go to war. Prepare them, get their armor on, get the swords on. But verse 13, first, however, they sent a delegation to talk with the tribes. Praise God for the delegation who went to talk. Joshua was like, hey, y'all, y'all get your armor on, but like, hey, you go talk to them. Make sure we got the full story, okay? I hope there's more to the story, but in case they don't, we're about to take their heads off, right? They sent a delegation to talk to them. They said, the whole community of the Lord demands to know why you are betraying the God of Israel. If you need the altar because the land you possess is defiled, well, we told you the east side stinks. We told you that ahead of time. So if you'd like to reconsider, that's okay too. They said, they said then you could just join us in the Lord's lands, but do not rebel against the Lord. Number one is simply this, get the full story. Do you know how often our first snap judgments are wrong? We get, it all, we get it wrong all the time. We think, I got all the information I need. Prepare to go to war. They about to, and this is what war in 2024 looks like. Here we go. I'm going to post something. I'm going to send a finely crafted text message. I'm going to send me an email because I feel like I got the whole story. How about you send a delegation first? How about you seek like, hey, this doesn't look good to me, but just in case I don't have the full story, tell me what's going on with this altar? <laughs> Why are we building a foreign altar? And we need to be careful not to do this. In fact, it, it makes me laugh that one local newspaper reported years ago that um, I want to read a clip from a local Minnesota newspaper. Uh, it, it, it was listing the police reports of the citizens of the area. And here's what it says, quote, complainant reported the neighbor's dog was left outside for days at a time. Someone say, how dare you? Leaving that dog out like that. Complainant was concerned for the dog's well-being. That's a good neighbor. The dog, uh, the dog in question was located, and then imagine being the neighbor when you read these next few words, and it was found to be a statue. <laughs> 
come on, that makes me laugh a little bit. You know, like, does that neighbor go, I was wondering why it was so obedient. <laughs> How dare them leave it out in the weather. And so before I get the whole story, I'm calling the cops. I'm calling the detectives. I'm calling everybody. And isn't that a picture of what we can do to our spouses? What we could do to someone in our small group? what we could do for somebody at the later experience, what we could do for somebody at the church down the road, or what we can do, come on, we, don't, we, we need to get the full story before we judge one another. It reminds me of what Proverbs 14, 17 says, an impulsive person has a short fuse and can ruin everything. But the wise show self-control. The impulsive says, get the army ready. We cutting all their heads off. But the wise say, let's send a delegation just in case. We don't have the whole story. So let me give you a few practical tips. This is like 1.1, three wise principles before, you, before having the full story. I wanna help you today. I wanna give you practicalities today. Number one, leave room to be wrong. I, I love how they responded. If, however, we have it wrong about your land and you built that altar because your land stinks, then come join us over on our side. They left room to be wrong. I think they were saying, God, I hope I'm wrong because I don't wanna attack my own family today. I don't wanna attack my own people today. Number two is seek understanding. The Bible said the whole community of the Lord demands to know why you've done this. I'm not sure that I would seek understanding with terms like we demand you answer us right now. Try that with your spouse later on. It ain't going to go that way. I demand to know. What were you doing? <laughs> but I love the fact that they sought understanding before they took swords out. Number three, refrain from verdicts. No wise judge renders a verdict before they've heard both sides of the story. They don't just let the prosecutor explain the case and then go, that's it. I don't need to hear anything from the defendant. Cut their head off. <laughs> Send them a nasty text message. No, 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 no. Listen, we've got to seek understanding first. And uh, here's number two. Four wise ways to deal with disagreements. Number two, self-assess before you address. Self-assess before you address. I, I, I'm grateful to know that the ten and a half tribes, uh, um, or the nine and a half tribes, I'm, I'm glad to know that they had to catch their own rage or anger or, or uh, feelings of how dare they before they just run in. And so they self-assess the situation. Let me share one of my favorite examples on... Um, on frustrations because we all deal with them and this helped me out a lot. Imagine that my right hand represents what you hoped to get in any situation. Imagine that my left hand is what you did get. Whenever what I hoped to get and what I did get come together, oh, there's no frustration, there's no hostility. I feel really good about this. But the more that what I expected to get differs from what I actually got, an emoji that I know nobody at City Hope has ever texted before <laughs> begins to come out. I don't know if you could see that well enough or not, but this is the cursing emoji because all of a sudden that we get angry and, and angrier. The, the wider the gap is between what I hoped you would do and what you did do. Come on, <laughs> any parents up in the house? I told you to get ready for bed. 78 minutes ago. <laughs> if I told you you'd get in bed seven seconds ago and you did, well, it's a happy night. Come on, I'm going to pray for you. We're going to put you to bed. I'm going to hang out with my wife. But if it was been, it's been 30 minutes, it's been 70 minutes, what are y'all doing in the bathroom and why is the toothpaste all over the sink counter? Okay, I got a lot of girls. I got a lot of girls. And you're just trying to manage the frustration. You're just trying to manage the gap. And the best thing we can do is self-assess before we address. Because if this is what's going on, there are things we can do like, hey, how about I pray before I address the situation? Hey, how about I seek their story? Because maybe their story was more like this. 
And this is calming me down. This is helping my spirit be at peace. This is helping me have self-control before I address someone else. Is this helpful for anybody? We got, to, we got to ask a question about ourselves. What can I learn about myself before I rush in? The Bible says it this way in Proverbs 15, 1. A gentle answer deflects anger. That means we got to get this gap closed before I even address you. But the harsh words make tempers flare. So you keep that gap this wide. Tell me how great your evening's going to be. It's going to be difficult. And so we got to self-address we got to self-assess before we address. Um, um, uh, self-assessment is all about self-awareness. And self-awareness is your tendencies, your character, your personality, your motives. And so it, imagine this. If I, got into, if I got blindsided in a car wreck the moment I left here, can you imagine this? That the best thing that I can do is self-assess. Is anything broken? How angry am I? I, I am I frustrated? Am, I, am I, 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 The best thing that I can do is walk away from the wreck not go confront them in the moment before I self-assess what's going on. Is this making sense? Because I might not be who I need to be. I might not be a very good witness in this moment because we all deal with frustrations. And by the way, frustrations aren't sin. It's how you respond to your frustrations that determines if you're about to sin and misrepresent God. So, we need to be able to remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7. Why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and fail to notice the glaring flaws of your own? Why would you address the east side without ever recognizing how angry you are on the west side? Yeah, they might have problems, but you're equally at fault right now. He's saying this, first, acknowledge and deal with your own blind spots, and then you will be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. He does not say you can't ever address. He does say self-assess before you address. I hope this is helping somebody here today. Here's, here's three ways to assess before you address. Ask yourself, what are my present feelings towards the other party? Am I, am I angry? Am I ticked? Am, am, am I sad? Am, am I let down? Am I judging? Address and know how you feel about them. Second, what are my motives for the fight? What am I hoping to accomplish here? Like, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. Great. What an awesome life-giving benefit after this one. We actually have to ask, like, what good am I trying to have in this? What are my motives? Am I trying to crush another person? Because that's not God. Our God is the lifter of our heads. So if I'm working in the same spirit, what are my motives for this? Is it to restore peace or is it to give them a piece of my mind? And then thirdly, your desired relationship after the fight. Oh, this one's key. I need to understand how I currently feel about the east side. And I need to understand what I hope to accomplish. And I also need to know what relationship do I desire after the disagreement because it changes the way I approach this situation. Number three, four wise ways to deal with disagreements. Don't get defensive. Nothing shuts down peacemaking and restoration like stonewalling and defensiveness and getting, um, um, es it escalates hostility whenever we encounter defensiveness. You know this, you've experienced it, and this is why I like the east side's response. The, the, it says that then the, tree, the three tribes, they answered the Lord, the mighty one, is God. He knows the truth. And may Israel know it too. At this point, the delegation has gone to the east side, and the east side is going, hold up. God is God. God is the only God. You're right. We know who he is. Listen to their response. We have not built the altar in treacherous rebellion against the Lord. If we have done so, yeah, kill us. <laughs> If we've done so, that's a pagan practice. We have no part in that. We, we shouldn't live. You should 
torch us for that. If you've done that, don't spare our lives this day. And so they are simply saying this. They're saying, I'm not going to attack back, and I'm not going to defend, and I'm not going to stonewall. It reminds me of the Gentile woman that one time Jesus approached, and she, and she said, hey, could, 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 you, could you move in my direction? And Jesus more or less likened her to a dog. In the New Testament, in the gospel, this could be a moment of high disagreement, high offense. It's a Gentile woman, but I love her response. Yes, but even the dogs would happily eat the scraps from the king's table. I'm not going to get defensive. I'm not going to get offended that you more or less called me beneath anyone else. I'm just not going to get that way today. I'm going to have an unoffendable heart. I'm going to seek reconciliation. And guess what Jesus said? We're going to write your story. I bet, I bet in that situation, he turned to Matthew and he said, you heard that account? Write that junk down. The way she just acted was great faith. And I wish I had more people acting this way. Matthew, did you get the story? Write it down. And we get the benefit of hearing it. See, write this down. No matter their tone, you still have control to influence a positive result. Now, I know, come on, ladies, men are the biggest violators of tone, right? I'm sure it happens to women, too, but I don't know. I'll just be transparent. I get this one a lot. It's not about what you said. It was about how you said it. Come on, I'm seeing some, all, all of a sudden, elbow hits are happening all up in here. You know, I, I've, I, I've never heard that one, Pastor. Come on. We've all dealt with this one before. But regardless of their tone, that doesn't excuse the tone. But what I'm saying is that doesn't mean I've lost control of impacting a positive result. And by simply agreeing, here's, here's some practical things that you could do. Two ways to avoid defensiveness. Seek to understand before being understood. This is simple things like, are you, are you saying that you're frustrated that uh, uh, um, this happened instead of that? You know, I'm seeking to understand the west side story before the east side response. I love it. If we did that, yeah, you should probably kill us too. And then the second one, respond with agreements first. Simple things like, yeah, you're right about that. And if that's what happened, I'd be just as frustrated as you. But we had a different motive than this. You get how the West Side received the East Side's response. Because they didn't say, you guys are a bunch of hot-headed losers. I can't believe you came over here like this. What kind of God followers are you? No, 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 that wouldn't go very well. They simply said, you're right. If we did that, we'd feel the same way. But that's not what our motives were. Let's look at number four. Seek, win, win, win. Pastor, I've heard before, seek, win, win. What's win, win, win? Well, can I tell you real quick that if you win the disagreement and they lose, you didn't win. They didn't win. We need to seek win, win. But the third one is God most high. Did God's name, reputation, Christianity, did it win because of how we just acted? We got to seek, did I honor God? Did I honor my adversary at the moment? And did I also add honor myself? Like I didn't just deal with the disagreement and just take it and take it. I, I addressed it. I'm good. They're good. God's good. And, and, and this is the end result of Joshua 22. I didn't have time to read the whole thing, but I would encourage you to read that story yourself. It says, when the west side heard the east side's response, it pleased them. And they said this, indeed, you've saved Israel from the hand of the Lord. Let me help you understand something. If the west side wins and the east side loses, God was uh, already shown that he will hold justice. He will, he will, there were times where one side won and other side lost, and there were repercussions for that. There were consequences for that. Come on, you, you know the story of David and Bathsheba. I'm not letting this offense go by without consequences. The child will die. You, you get what I'm, they're, 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 this is in our Bible, so I need to help you understand that he's saying, seek win, win, win. In this situation, they said, yeah, we might have won, but the west side would have lost if we had not done well in this disagreement. The judgment of God would have been on us too. 
And so they said, praise God, you responded the way you did, and we responded the way we did, and so we win, you win, God wins, let's continue to praise the Lord. I want to give you a promise today that when you do things win, 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 you're going to have disagreements. You're going to have disagreements. But when you do things win, 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 heaven gets bigger, hell gets smaller, people who are lost go, how do you do that? How in the world did you keep your temper down? How in the world were you able to respond that way? How has your marriage lasted so long? How, how are your kids respectful of you this way? How, how is your church growing like this? How are, how are you doing things? Come on, I want, I don't know about you, but I want to give God the biggest glory that I possibly can while I'm breathing air on this earth. Can we stop and give him a praise break right now? One of the ways we do that is by how we handle disagreements. John 17, 21, this is what Jesus said in his final prayer, and I'm so glad Jesus let John eavesdrop on this and write it down. Jesus said in John 17, 21, talking to the Father, he said, Father, I pray that all of them, my disciples, will be one just as you and I are one. And he said, if they are one, so that the world will believe you sent me. How will the world know Jesus is the son of God? By the way you and I hold our unity. By the way we stand one in the midst of disagreements. In the, by the way we stand by one God, one faith, one Lord, one Holy Spirit, one unity, one forgiveness, one reconciliation, one salvation. Is anybody understanding what I'm saying? It means that the way you and I act in disagreeing times determines how much glory God gets. So I understand that what God is asking us to do is not easy. It's not easy in families. It's not easy in churches, small groups, teams, workplaces. But if heaven and hell are on the line, then you and I can't just rush into dealing with disagreements in an unbiblical way. Take comfort by this, Matthew 28, 20. The final words of Jesus in the book of Matthew say this, but take comfort, be sure of this, I will be with you. Let me speak to somebody who's on the west side. I'm not talking about what side of Wichita Falls you live on, what side of the church you're sitting on. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you feel wronged, You're like, Pastor, please don't preach a message of reconciliation. You don't know what they did to me. Jesus says, I get that this will be difficult, but here's the great news. I will be with you when you go to the east side. East side, those who've been accused, attacked, wrongfully attacked, been there before. And it's good to know that our God is saying, man, they are nasty. They're coming out with the worst of the worst. They're tweeting all the time. They're writing things. They're spreading rumors. They're starting gossip. None of it's even true. It's good to know. God says, hey, listen up. When you do get to talk, I will be with you. You're not going to be alone in this disagreement. The God of reconciliation and peace wants to pervade your your heart and comfort you. He goes before you, he stands inside you, he stands behind you, and he is with you. Can I pray over you this morning? I just want you to receive this. Holy Spirit, I know you're in this room and I know you're moving right now. Holy Spirit, I know that you bring conviction sometimes And there's many people in here who knows I've got to make this right with somebody. The last time I preached, you moved me to walk off the stage and write a letter to someone. And maybe that's a similar spirit right now. Some are being convicted. I need to make this right. I need to write a letter. I need to have a conversation. I need to set up a coffee meeting. I need to seek understanding. I need to lay down my judgment. Father, if that's it, that's going to be difficult to do but you will be with them right now. And if they're the ones wrongfully attacked, Father, I know it's really hard to let go of offense, 
but in Jesus' name. The same Jesus who said, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Let that kind of freedom reign in this place over everybody listening. So Father, I pray that kind of peace in our soul. And we have a part to play in it. We've got action steps we need to take from this prayer forward. But thank you, thank you, thank you, God, that you will be with us always when we do it. Before we raise our heads before we end this prayer I feel like there are some people who are in a disagreement with God the worst disagreement you can be in is one with God where you know I'm not living the way God called me to live I've been living selfishly I've been living for my own desires and and I've got I've got sin in my life and it's a disagreement I know I'm going to have to confront that one day if I stand before God here's the good news of the gospel Jesus already knows And he says, while we were still yet sinners, Christ took the cross and died on our behalf so that when we stand before him, there will be no disagreement because Jesus has already paid the price for you and I's sin. But the catch is that you've got to put your faith in Jesus Christ and confess him as your Lord and Savior. With every head still bowed, every eye closed, I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I don't want you to be embarrassed when you stand before God one moment. That when the day comes, I don't want you to be nervous. I want you to be excited to get to see God who you're at peace with. If you're in this place and you say, today, I want to I confess my sin silently from my seat. I want to get right with God. Or, or maybe you're saying, I want to go all in with Jesus for the first time or for the first time in a long time. Would you swiftly throw your hand up in the air? No one's looking around. I just, heaven sees exactly what's going on. And I'm seeing hands up, hands down. I'm seeing hands all around. And so I'm so thankful for your courage in this place. Thank you. Is there anyone else who says, hey, pastor, I've got to. I see you in the back. Thank you so much. You can put your hand down. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody look at me. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you will, guaranteed, someone say, you will, say you will. You will be saved. So everyone who just raised their hand, when I raised my hand in 2002, I didn't know how to pray that prayer, but I did have all the faith in my heart. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to ask all of City Hope to say it out loud with you, but I can't make you believe the words coming out of your mouth. So everybody lean into these words, especially if you raise your hand. Pray with me. Say, Jesus, I'm coming to you. I'm in love with you. I'm getting to know you, and I thank you that you died on the cross for me. I confess to you my sin. I know I've made mistakes, and I'm asking you to forgive me now. Thank you for the fresh start that I get starting today because of the cross that Jesus died on. I love you, Jesus, and I want to follow you the rest of my days. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said, amen. Come on.